So uh, welcome to the Software Product Line conference tutorial on domain-specific languages. This is a tutorial where we describe how variability can be captured with domain-specific languages and, and models. And the, the, the basically tutorial has a, a schedule and uh, contents in which we look two kind of different things. The, the first one is I'll introduce you to domain specific languages and models and how they differ from the type of models you have been using so far, like a SysML or UML or things like that. And I also show why they are superior on expressing variability. And then I show industry cases. And uh, after the industry cases, I'll I'll go and show how to create domain specific languages for particular product lines and how to create languages and how industry have been creating those languages and what are the steps to define the languages. And then after that, we'll look how to, how to use generators and how to create generators so that we don't make models just for fun and discussion and communication but we can use models to generate our product variants. And then we have a, have a summary. But in this uh, tutorial, the idea is that we also do a little bit uh, thinking here. So this is a hands-on kind of tutorial. Hands-on in a matter that I will do based on what you say or what you think we should do. So I have here a couple of tasks in which we define the language for particle product line. Uh, just a few words about me. I will be doing this tutorial together with my, my colleague, Stephen Kelly. He, he was here just shortly. But uh, I work for a company called Metacase, which makes a modeling and code generation tool. This is mostly used in product line companies. And because I, I have been working for 20 years for these kind of companies, I, I have been involved in creating these languages. Uh, just few turnkey solutions, but mostly in assisting in the early steps of how to define a language and how to make a code generator. I have wrote a book of this uh, topic for, for Wiley, and, uh, and I'm still an adjunct professor in the uh, university in Finland. But it's my, my hobby. I, my full time goes to, to, to work in the industry. So uh, let let uh, get started. That how domain specific modeling that I have here, how domain specific modeling is different than than maybe what you have seen seen earlier. So I I borrow here the slide from from Christoph Czarnecki and Uri Eisenecker, where they say that the product line has a spectrum of variability. On the one end, we have what we call routine configuration. Routine is something when you install a printer for your PC. So you have a wizard and the wizard asks the questions to, to set the variation for your printer. And basically someone has defined a decision tree so that when you make a decision number, uh, number two, then there are three options and you navigate the path here. And all choices are known and all implementations are available. Just like when you are saying that I would like to add a printer to my network or Bluetooth or whatever, based on these decisions, it make you a navigation here. The, the more creative based on Czarnetsky uh, and Eisenecker is that you have a featured model. And I think that I don't need to much explain what the feature model and feature trees are in the product line conference. But basically we don't navigate the path in a tree, but we have a, a multiple subtrees in this feature tree. So when we make a decisions like usually mandatory uh, multiple or, or kind of decisions, uh, we, we, we have a larger variation space to be selected, like it, like it, unlike in the decision tree. But still here, all the features are known 
and feature implementations are available if we want to automate it. Of course, we can make a feature tree without have, having any automation yet done. We just plan that this is something to be implemented later on. And then they say that the most creative construction, or let's say more creative construction, is where we are using a domain-specific language. And the language is something what, what they say to be subgraph of an infinite graph, which means that we have a language and we can use the language to express all different ways to variations. But it also means that just like in the English language, not necessarily all the wordings are yet sane because I can create new sentences based on the grammar and implement it here, instantiate it here, like here. So with the domain specific language, someone creates the meta model. And then when we create the product variants, we use the language and instantiate it for making the models. And this means that the language sets the variation space, but we don't know yet all the variants. So language users can then make and implement totally a new kind of variants which are not known. Of course, here on the left side, if we go beyond the slide on the left side, I could have something like a parameter table, for instance, which is more uh, smaller set of uh, decisions because I have just decisions, but no, no relations between decisions. Or on the other right side, I could have a creative construction where I can, I, I can just program with anything if I like. I don't have any rules. I can, I can, I can be very creative, but uh, <clears throat> also it cannot be much uh, automated. So let me show here an example of uh, of uh, software product line, and because this conference is not any more software product line, it's actually system and software product line. Uh, I'll I'll use here uh, a product line that contains both hardware and and the software side. And I like sailing, so sometimes I saw these kind of places on the, on the sea, or lake or in the river. And these, uh, these uh, fish farms are, are uh, product lines with different levels. First of all, uh, there, there can be a number of ponds, a uh, number of sensors like uh, muddiness of the water or water level, temperature, whatever, actuators like feeding the fishes or, or, or heating or, or lights and so forth. There is a variation in communication depending on how many uh, fish farm uh, systems we have. There is a variation in functionality, what you can do. If you have a baby fishes, you can do different things for them, un unlike if they are in a sea, for instance. Uh, the fish farm owner has an iPad or a tablet where he can click the screen to see that how the fishes are doing or maybe activate a feeder or something. There is a variation in a database that each fish farm has a different uh, database schema that saves the persistent values how the how the history has been doing. For example, what has been the pH value of the water? And then there is a variation of material needs. How much cabling, for instance, is needed? How many ponds you have needed? What kind of uh, power supplies are needed? These need to be deployed and and uh, and maintained uh, regularly, because let's say that there's some disease in a in a salmon in Norway, then suddenly you start uh, configuring your fish farm differently so that you can provide the supply for salmon if you are let's say in Austria. And what the, what the company basically did that this is huge number of variation, and a company in Austria. Uh, build a, a domain specific language for fish farm automation. And the domain specific concepts are here, what you can see here in a classical user interface in the toolbar. And here you can also see many of these concepts, like these blue ellipses here are ponds. So this is a fish farm which have different kinds of uh, ponds. Some are made in the land, 
someone may be in the sea, lake, or river, and then they have different uh, uh, capabilities, like these as, these as aerators or feeders. And then there you can see also here the language concepts that uh, whether they have a water level, temperature sensor, muddiness sensor, uh, pH value, and so forth. And the idea here is that when you build a new fish farm for a customer A, someone goes there and creates this kind of high level model. Maybe it does not put all the details here, but at least where are the locations of ponds and how many and which kind of capabilities they should have. And then someone in the, in the office knows maybe more about the power supply or, or some other aspects and configures this model more. So they use high level domain specific concepts and then they still generate everything needed here. But without using these low level programming concepts or writing word documents. So they have also here variant generators. They have a number of generators here. And if they produce the code generators, oh, this shows the example of variation that if you have here like a concept of aerator selected, here are then the variation that you can choose from the aerator, like what kind of voltage it has. Maybe it's a battery only, or what kind of oxygen type it provides. So this is a variation for aerators. Other elements may have different uh, variations, plus also the connectivity. But the nice part of productivity side is that you can then generate from this model or these models all the required output. So they also they generate the, the PLC code. So 61131, which is the industrial PC code. Uh, so that nobody writes that code manually, but it gets generated. We will look at the second part of the tutorial how this code generation is, is done. But they also produce hardware mappings visualization for the iPad so that the screen looks like this pond on the iPad as well, because then the human mind knows which pond is which when we click the aerator or feeder on. It also produces the configuration and schema for the databases and also all the documentation and installation guidelines. And they even go so far that they generate stickers for the wiring closet. So when someone goes and rows with the boat, and installs it and puts the cable on, they have a sticker to the cable next to the wire, what this wire is about. So even that sticker is generated. So they don't need to maintain these manually, or they don't need to keep these in sync manually, because they all cut from the single source. And for the next fish farm, they do yet another model and for the next fish farm another model and so forth but the the delivery the design of the variant and its delivery is highly automated and uh, this makes the development uh, in product line fundamentally fast really 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 fast so companies like uh, panasonic on home automation have said that they have a, like 500% productive improvement because of using domain specific languages and generating the variants. A company called Polar, which makes uh, sports instruments, they say at least 750% productivity increase. But in some other areas like EADS, which is a military supplier, Airbus, they are not so keen maybe on the productivity, but they would like to, to to have a, a more emphasis on quality. So the, the domain specific language also has a quality aspect that if I want to make something illegal clicks here or put the pond on top of each other pond, it's not uh, possible. So the, the, so the tool knows what kind of variants are possible. So ideally speaking, we cannot generate things if there are some errors here. So therefore, the, the, the quality aspect is also important here. And there are also some publications on different areas releasing different kind of productivity, the, the figures. So this all comes to the point that 
if you have a repetition, you have a product line, you have a variance, you configure a single product, you run or code generate those multiple times, you, you get investment back very quickly compared to more traditional uh, copying the code or copying and cloning kind of approaches. Plus, you can also make new functionality, something that you can't have in a feature model, for example, at all. If your variation is like a sequence in order, you can't make really a feature model for execution order. But with domain-specific language, it's easy to do. Uh, of course, you don't get nothing. You don't get things for free. And also with domain-specific languages, you don't get things for free. You, ne you need to, to do investment. And that investment is that someone in the company must create the, the, uh, the language, the domain-specific language uh, for, the, for the given product line. And the amount of investment then varies depending on the case. And also the, the place where you get the payback of your investment co compared to your current approach varies from product line to product line. But I'll, I'll, I'll show a couple of examples. I mentioned uh, Panasonic. Here you can see uh, their domain specific language. This is in, in Japan. Uh, and they are building these kind of uh, touchscreen devices for uh, home controllers, burglary, heating, alarms, things like that. And then they have also cheaper microcontroller, which has some of the same functionality. But they implemented this language and C and HTML generators, and, and they used like three weeks to implement it. Three working weeks. To, to implement this language and C and HTML generator. And then they, they run uh, control trials. So building a, a typical embedded controller capabilities that took earlier 17, 18 days, they could do now in, a, in a less than a week. So you could say with the simple, simple maths that, okay, if we are building two variants, this space back, Another company uh, that I mentioned already earlier makes uh, uh, these kind of sports watches for professional uh, sports people. And the, these have a lot of uh, sensors. Uh, I mean, really, really a lot, 20 different kinds, depending on which kind of sport you are dealing with. And this is the only figure we are allowed to show from them. Uh, where, where you can see that this basically models the user interface applications that you have here. So half of the code here varies from product to product and roughly half of the code is the same. For example, code for battery management or uh, code for the uh, measuring your heartbeat, that is always, always the same. But then what, what kind of applications you have Let's say if you are uh, skiing downhill, you have altitude. But in, in if you are doing a football, you don't need altitude. Or soccer, you don't need altitude measurement. And this is the best case we are knowing because the expert in the company who, who has been programming this manually with C implemented a domain-specific modeling language that you can see over here together with C code generator. And, and it was something like 80 hours when we asked. So seven, eight days he used to implement the language. And then they, then they could build a feature in two, three days that earlier took a month. So this is the best case we are knowing. And this was a controlled experiment. But this was in, 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 in Finland. So they also, because in many cultures, including Finland, they, they value individual developers' opinions a lot. They, they did also an experiment where they asked six programmers uh, to try this language and then compare to their previous experience. 
that how long it took them to implement a typical feature. So they asked them to use it for a couple of hours. That make this model and generate your code and then compare to the code quality and, and learnability aspects. And they found out that, that uh, the programmers thought that this is something like 10 times faster when they are modeling and generating code compared to writing the code manually in C. And the last example I have is, is from a company uh, which makes military systems. And this is domain specific language for military radio testing, radio network testing. So these kind of uh, ad hoc networks that you maybe make for the, in the, for the airplanes, for instance, that how, you're, how, your peel, how your people in the ground are communicating with the people on, the, on, on flying the planes. So they build this kind of domain specific language for test cases and they generate TTC and three, which is the test, uh, test, uh, test language applied for telecom area. So this small model says something like a device one makes point to point call to device three after two seconds sends the call after one second, device seven makes a group call for all the devices here and after five seconds sends the call. This, this kind of a discussion. And, and uh, they used two, two weeks to implement this uh, modeling language and TTC and three generator. And then after we asked them how it went, the, the, uh, the guy in the meeting room said that in this afternoon, I created the same test I was writing manually last week. No scientific measurement, but just gut feeling. And in this tutorial, I cannot use any of these real world examples. So I'll, I'll use our example, an example that we all know. And this example is a, is a, is a digital wristwatch. So something that we have in our hand and deals with the time. So the watch product line contains different applications Everybody usually has a time, but if you have a coach, you may have a stopwatch or lap time. If you are a traveler, you have a world time and so forth. And then they have a lot of variation depending on what, how big screen you have and how many buttons and time zones and icons and, and things like that you have. So I have here a, a small demonstration uh, to, be, to be shown. So you get the idea what, what it looks like. So I have here a, a digital wristwatch family. And in my current imaginary product line, I have a five uh, digital wristwatches. And one of the models is called ACE. And this model is a, is a watch for an adventure person. The, the other, other products are made for other kind of market needs. And now this domain specific language says that if we have a watch, it has a one display. And one display has a number of icons, number of time units, and uh, a number of buttons. And so this is the static structural view of the display. And I cannot do anything else here than maybe add here icons. So the language restricts what I can do, what kind of variation I can add. But this is just a static. The, the ACE has also dynamic variation, behavioral variation. And here you can see TASTW, which is a five different application it has. It's an acronym, time, alarm, stopwatch, timer, world time applications. So if I put battery to my watch, it goes to a time, from time to an alarm, from alarm to a stopwatch. And then here is my, my stopwatch application. And if I would be modeling here now, my modeling concepts are not fish farm or military radio or home automation concept, but my language is now about digital watches. So actions, alarms, patterns, displays, states, and so forth. 
and now I can model my application. Like if I would like to add here a new functionality, like this is a lap time. Uh, I, I can now say that, oh, when I'm in a running mode, I can go to a lap time mode. And I can do it only if I press the down button. So pressing the down button is the one that triggers my transition. And if I press down button again, then I can go back to the running. So I'm, I'm thinking the solution now in terms of digital wristwatch, even though I can generate here uh, C, C sharp or, or, or code out of here. But this is the generated C code, but I don't think the solution in terms of C code, I think the solution by using high level digital wristwatch concepts. And to, to, to be able to, to summarize this example, I add here also one function to calculate the lap time. So I, I reuse here the, the, uh, the time variables and this language has small arithmetic operations. So I could say that let's calculate tap, lap time taking system time minus start time and put the result into, into a stop time. So now I have made my design and the next thing what we could do is we could try out whether my great lap time feature is working. So I can run here a build code generator. It now generates me a C sharp and animates my models. So it, it produces me the, the, the code and then co calls the .NET compiler that every Windows machine has. And then once it is ready, it should show me my my five models somewhere. Let me see where they are. They are somewhere behind the screen. Oh, they are behind the Zoom screen. <laughs> so here you can see the five uh, models. And if I now run this uh, uh, ACE model where we added the lap time function, it opens me uh, the application and then we can try it out. And I'll press here a couple of times. We are now in the alarm clock. I, I press once more. And now we are here in this stopwatch application and in the stop state. So if I press up button, we are now in a running state and now we can try out this killer feature of being able to take the lap time if we press down button. And if I press anything else here, nothing should happen. But if I press down button again, now we are back in the running state. So I have a very, uh, in this example with the domain specific language, I have a very good capabilities for making different kind of digital wristwatches for different market needs, even though I don't have yet all the features like let's say lap time implemented. So based on the customer needs within this product line, engineers can quickly make different kind of product variants. If there are any questions, uh, feel free to, to, to shout or write in the, in the chat tools. And I'll try them to, to, to address them. If there are no questions, let's, let's, uh, let's continue. I will use in this uh, tutorial, this digital wristwatch as an example, we can do language changes there uh, while we go. So let's move then on how to create these languages and, uh, um, and what the language is about and how it can address variability and how we specify them with, with meta models. Basically, we can define that every language, uh, development language, computer language consists of abstract syntax, concrete syntax, and, and, and semantics. So the abstract syntax is something that we define in the meta model. And, and if, we have a, if we have a concept like, a, like in a digital wrist or something that we can see here uh, visible, we could say that 
it is important that we can express displays. So our meta model contains a, a display and, and maybe characteristics. What are the display? Display might have a name, for instance. And then the, the, the concrete syntax is that what it looks like when we are modeling it with our language. So we, in our example that I demonstrated, we had this kind of a display, which is called X022, which means uh, uh, coming names from here. So we have a concept in the meta model, it's visualization, and then the semantics are, are defined uh, usually in two ways. They are something what we say, if I say a watch display, most people know that, oh, it's, it's something that I can see here on the screen. But it has also the formal semantics that is defined by using a code generators that reads the models and then produces uh, the, the output. So what the meta model looks like, uh, <clears throat> if we have a, the most simplest form of, of meta model, not even a decision tree, but just a parameter table, we could define a meta model saying that our variation is a pair of name and value. And when we are using this kind of very small parameter language, we could say that, oh, we have a, a parameter time unit and its value is, is showing seconds. So when we are then one level lower, we are running the, our application. We have here time unit uh, a second visible. So here's the meta model, model and instant. We may have a little bit uh, better a meta model where we don't have a single parameter, but we have a parameter list. So we have a parameter list that contains multiple parameters. For instance, at the model level, we could have then a parameter like time unit and also another parameter called what application it has, like a timer application. But we can also make this parameter list a domain specific. So rather than having a value pair, name value pair, we could have a watch specific parameter list, which says that we can have a, uh, each watch has a parameter like name and how many icons it has uh, and whether it shows hours, minutes, seconds or hundreds of seconds. And it also could have a, as a parameter, how many buttons it has and also which kind of buttons they are. So when we instantiate this watch parameter list, it, it looks like this. So this is more, uh, more specific to the, to the variation that watch product lines may have. And these meta models are quite simple. I have just an object and they have properties. But if we look more complex modeling languages, like maybe all of us here in this software product line conference know about, we have a feature tree. And here we have a meta model of that feature tree. So we have in a meta model, a feature and feature has a name and it must be a string. And we could say, for example, further in our meta model that feature name is mandatory. So it's not possible to add a feature rectangle element here without having a name. And then it also has a, a link, the line you can see over here. So there is a, a link called has feature. So I can connect two features uh, together. And it has also roles like end role and has role. And I can freely change the names as, as I like here, but this is the current meta model I have. And the end role has two, has a property. I can, I can only see this as one property here, but it has a property meaning mandatory or optional. So this is a very small, uh, feature model. This does not support, for example, 
uh, and features or show features that I need to, for example, choose only one of, for example, that the button can only be press or rotate. So with my current feature model, I can only say that the button may optionally be press or may optionally be rotate. But I cannot say at the moment that only one of these can be selected. So this is a uh, <clears throat> somewhat the expressiveness of this language is uh, limited. But I can have a better meta model. Here you can see this kind of a digital wristwatch uh, meta model. And I have here, uh, sorry, digital wristwatch model. And this uh, modeling language is, includes also uh, optionality and uh, mandatory, but it also has support for alternative features or all features. And here is the meta model. So it has the same kind of object here. Feature has a name, maybe binding time and some description. It also has a definition that each feature must be unique. So I cannot write two icon features or two rotate features, meaning different features. And it also have here roles like mandatory role or optional role. And then I may have also cardinality that if I have icons, how many of those icons I may have. But then the additional things is also here that I have alternative feature, which says that if I have a link from one feature from here, feature has linked from one alternative feature to two or many, two or more features. So I can here decide that uh, alternative feature is only possible if I have two sub features to be selected or more. And in a similar manner, there's all feature uh, shown over here. So now I have a different meta model, which is more expressive than the definition over here. And related to this uh, language definition. So basically meta modeling means that you can modify the language and then you can try it out immediately and use it. And if you are not happy with your modeling capabilities, you change the meta model and try it out. So if you have situations that you are not happy with the existing feature modeling language or with the SysML or UML or PPN or whatever, normally you cannot do much about it because the modeling language is fixed in the tool. You cannot change it. You can call it the tool vendor or you can make it by your programming yourself. Uh, that's about the options you have. But if you are using a meta model based tool, you can change this meta model and continue using it immediately. So this is the main, uh, main difference to what you have been using, maybe modeling languages in the past, that languages have been fixed and if you're not happy, there is not much you can do about it. In meta model based tools, the things is different. This meta model and this feature modeling language is a typical feature modeling language in that respect that it has nothing to do with any particle domain. I showed earlier a parameter, watch parameter list, which was dedicated to watches. But there was also a parameter list that was applicable for any kind of product line. Basically, we can use the same meta model to also create uh, languages that are dedicated to the uh, variation within, the, within a specific product line. I'll demonstrate it to you earlier with the example running this kind of a watch uh, product line where we have a two products in this sample model. Uh, and 
this model is expressed with this meta model. So we say here that we have a watch which has a name like Celestra, Celestron, Ace, and so forth. And they contain of, of uh, the displays and logical watches. And the display itself contains a set of patterns, icons, and unit zones. So the, these are expressed over here. And then we also have a, a logical watch that each model must have also some behavior that is expressed in, in this example. And this is now more precise in, in respect to variation in the product line that uh, the meta model is instantiated as a modeling language. And the rule how the instantiation can be done is set here in the meta model. So if I want to add the watch, I also need to add one logical watch and one display. And this language now only deals with this uh, variability that is most related to display. But we have also another meta model for describing the behavior. As you saw, I was adding that lap time functionality. So here, when we are meta model model and we are running the product, but I also have the same for the <clears throat> for this time application. So this is the model describing my time application that I can see what is my current time. I have here a show state, edit hours, edit minutes. So if I want to move to the uh, daylight saving time or I travel and I move to different time zones, then I can edit hours or edit minutes. But this language, which is a state machine, basically enriched state machine with the domain behavior from a watch, is can, can be also descri described through the meta model. In a very similar manner, I describe the parameter tables or different kind of feature models. So to, to, to show this um, meta model, we have here the uh, meta model definition for the state, which are these uh, red uh, rectangles. So each state has a name, what uh, time unit it, it, uh, it uh, optionally shows, and it has also a documentation, and it also has one display function. Display function means what display it shows in which state. And the meta model may have also rules, like that uh, state must be, for example, unique. So we should not have a two states in the state machine with the same name, meaning different states. Makes things very complicated for humans to understand if that would be the possibility. We may also have in the meta model rules like that the state name must be mandatory. So we should not have a states without names. So those kind of things we can add to the meta model. So once we have this kind of uh, meta model defined, we can add here states. We can also add here buttons and buttons have a name and then we have a transitions. So we have a transition from one state to another state or to the stop state. But we, we are not allowed to make a transition from state to the start state. So if I would like to create a link from this show to this start state, it's not allowed because the meta model does not allow such thing. So the language guides me to do only legal kind of specifications. But if I would be using feature modeling here, I, I could also do easily that kind of feature model, which would make which, which would not make sense in a in a product line of uh, digital wristwatches. So we have here a transition between the uh, uh, states and each transition may have a one from role and one to role, and each transition uh, has also one possible button pressing event. So I could have a state transition without button being pressed, but only one button can be pressed at a time. 
So I can link one pattern to this transition. And also there can be one action. And the action has its own meta model of, of adding values and setting values and, and so forth. So with this kind of meta model, I can make then digital uh, wristwatches and express their uh, variability. And uh, okay, there's the rest of the concepts, but as you see, I don't have all the digital wristwatch applications defined. I have only language defined so that the language users can then innovate and make different kind of features. So this means that I have one language meta model, and this is what domain engineers do. And then application engineers can then use this language and create a variant like the time application you see, so, or other kind of applications. But the other applications are all based on the same language. So they are all in these models are all instances of this meta model. So let's take then the first task. And I would like to uh, challenge you with, with this uh, task. So the, the idea what we have here is that at the moment, the meta model that we have only allowed that I press the button once and then the watch makes something. So only a single press button policy triggering. But what, what if we would like to do other kind of, uh, other kind of variations, we would like to uh, make it larger. For example, in this case, uh, we have a long pressing button policy that if you keep a button press for three seconds, for instance, it starts to make then something, something different. Or maybe we could have two button pressing. If I keep two buttons pressed, it makes something special and so forth. So the task here is that what, what it would mean that in our current language, we would have here a possibility to, to do more than use one button to, to one button pressing to, to trigger the transition. So how you would change this language? If you have any ideas, feel free to shout, feel free to, to write to the chat tool. But obviously this would require that we change somehow the meta model. So the boss comes and says, we have two limited user, user interface controls single click policy, we want to have a long pressing button policy. So <clears throat> that would mean that we extend the meta model and there are different ways to, to do that. And one way would be that we add here, at the moment we have here one button, but we could say that, oh, we have a long pressing button. But if you really look to analyze the domain and you, you look your watch, maybe you, you may have a buttons that you can only press long time, but maybe the button pressing policy is actually policy of, of the event it gives rather than the button itself. So we could say that here in this language, when we press the button, we have this in our meta model, we have this concept of, uh, let me, show here the event the button triggers the event maybe the button pressing policy is a property of this event so we modify this event in our meta model so i i could access this meta model so here you can see the concept of event or here should be the concept of of a button but we modify now this language while we are using it. So I add here to this event, I add here a new property 
called long pressing. And we could analyze this, this further that, oh, is this five second pressing or maybe we have also 10 second pressing or, or something. But for the sake of, of uh, this tutorial, I'll, I'll say here that it's just a Boolean, whether it's a normal pressing or maybe it's a long pressing. And if this is accepted uh, to the meta model, I could now go and, and, and in my modeling language say that, oh, now I can express this bigger variation space of how we are using patterns, because now this is a long pressing policy and, and, and this isn't. So we will next go through different ways to express variation with languages. But what is common for all of them is that that there is an access to the language definition itself. So we can modify the language to meet our particle need, like, like this small uh, demonstration uh, uh, showed here. And uh, <clears throat> the question comes then that what kind of approaches we are using to, to address variab variability. Uh, Two years ago, we reviewed with, with my colleague, uh, Stephen. Stephen is back here. Uh, we looked 23 industrial cases where companies had created domain specific languages for their product line. And we wanted to analyze how they, what, is, what was the basis for them to create domain specific language for variation. And we, identified six, six different cases. And these, this identification was done by analyzing the meta models they have done. So we could access the, the, the meta models. And in most cases, we, we were not implementing the meta models, but we have still access for them. And the, we found out that the cases were of six different category, and most of them belong to the three main approaches. The first approach was what you already saw with the, with the fish farm case. And this is what we call a classical domain specific language followed by David Weiss and Robert Line on their book on creating domain specific languages for product lines. And the classical is that you, you, you make a, you apply the language to create models for one variant and there is no reuse between the variants. Like here with the case of fish farm, if you create the models for fish farm one, and then there are changes to the, to the fish farm two, those changes do not influence at all to the fish farm one. So they are treated totally separate. And the nice part of this approach is, and maybe also explains its popularity, is that it, it it provides a clear process and organizational structure. So the people who are using the domain specific language, they don't need to care about other variants. So this is not like 150% model, meaning that the model expresses all the product lines, all the family members at once, all the possible family members at once. The language users only focus on a single variant. So there can be other teams who make other fish farms at the same time, but I don't need to care about them. I only focus on mine. And most of the cases that we analyzed uh, belong to, belong to this, this category. Uh, or oh, it was the sing single largest category. Uh, the other approach is that what companies then face is that they start to realize that, oh, I, I created the variant one, and then I start to make a variant two, but actually things created to in variant one would be useful and nice in variant two. So I don't need to uh, create it again in isolated. So then we can add to the language 
possibilities to reuse. And in this example, for example, in the variant one, uh, where, where call comes in and based on the location, the proxy handles it in these sub actions. If this sub action has another sub model, when we make a variant two, they may reuse and refer to the same sub action. So the guys who define the variant two don't need to define this process described underneath here again. So the modeling language has a specific concept for, for uh, using, reusing certain parts already done. And it could be also that the reuse is, is restri restrict, restricted, that we can only use maybe location. This is a call processing area, this domestic language. But we could only make, a, let's say, reuse for things related to the location, for instance. Or the reuse concept like sub action could be white box or black box, uh, meaning that can the variant team number two see the details of sub action? Or is it something that they can just use as, as a black box? I, I'm just referring for that, but I don't see what's going on inside. And here in this call processing language, this is a single language. Uh, but it could be that the sub action language is based on different meta model. So we have a language where we describe static structure, and then maybe the sub actions are describing more the behavior, dynamic aspects. Or maybe they are the both, like in this case. And this is also our task, second task for, 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 for our tutorial here that what if what we if our digital wristwatch product line would like to use the the same uh, watch application like like a timer or time in in other products for example i i would expect that all almost all digital wristwatches have a time application. So it doesn't make sense that every variant watch product team makes their own time, but we could like to reuse the same time application and not do like a fish farms where every variant is, 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 is treated as, uh, as separate. So, so how to how to do that? That kind of thing would be that uh, we add to our meta model capabilities to to reuse watch applications. And uh, in our case of this digital wristwatch, this is made so that we add here a meta model where we say that any state can be referred to another application. So if we have a variant number one, product variant number one, which has a time stopwatch and timer application, the timer application, this reference is detailed here in more detail, what a timer makes. And then another team, rather than doing this, like in a classical DSL, no reuse, we could have an, this kind of language where other, other team adding world time and other applications may still refer to the same timer application than the team who had made variant one. Uh, it, it, uh, so we reuse the same timer application that the team of variant one has made. By doing very uh, small uh, change to the uh, meta model. And then uh, the third category, where rather than adding uh, capabilities to, to reuse, the third category that we found out were approaches where, we, where companies create the models and uh, wanted to express 
uh, whole product line. People call this term 150% model. So a model that expresses more than single variant. And in that model, add information in, in about the variation. And it can be in a bottom up or top down. For instance, here is a user interface for an infotainment system in a car. And one feature like a navigation system is described. And its availability depends on availability of GPS. So only if this GPS is available, then only navigation system is available. So the model describes here also settings and schedules and locks and other features. But, but this navigation system becomes available only when the GPS is applied. So we create a large model and then we add there to the single elements when they are available and when they are not. And the other approach is that we, we make it more like a top down. So we add a configuration level on top of existing models. For instance, and this is what, what is done with the, the digital wristwatch. So we have a, <clears throat> uh, this is the lap time model, but we have a, a sporty model that does not have down buttons at all and has no room for icons. So maybe it's just a model for coaches and, and coaches don't want, just want to see the stopwatch and lap time functionality, but they don't have down buttons and they don't have a stopwatch icons at all. Still, we want to reuse the same design that also works for products which have down button and, and stopwatch icon. And this would be a task uh, the third task as well, how we should extend the language. So we could express uh, things like when a certain feature or a certain icon, uh, certain uh, button or certain icon are available or not available. And this is what we did with our uh, meta model that you already actually saw. So we have this kind of uh, uh, family model that, that configures individual application models. So if we have a sporty model over here, the sporty has just a mode set and up buttons, but it doesn't have down button. It only has a timer icon, but it doesn't have a stopwatch icon. So when we define this kind of um, uh, language, we had already this meta model that you saw earlier. So we have a language that where we express configuration over this information. So when we generate, for example, uh, and depending on how a platform works, we could of course generate everything and then the platform just shows what are available when it's executed or the code generator could look that when producing the code from here, it could look like, well, I don't have a stopwatch, so I don't, I don't generate these uh, icon visualization parts of the code when we are generating the code. And when we analyzed the 23 cases, we found out that uh, most approaches were this classical DSL, no reuse, or some reuse with the reference, or marking and filtering or modifying. But it was also common that in the beginning, uh, some companies only wanted to build the language for classical DS, no reuse, only later to find out that, no, actually, we want to add reuse capabilities later on. So four cases that we analyzed were such that they started with the classical DSL, no reuse. And after doing it a little bit file, they found out that we don't want to keep things separate. We want to reuse existing specifications and we want to extend 
the domain specific language uh, to that level. And the, the remaining uh, three categories were, were more rare, but uh, just to, to, to show the idea if these cases is that it's quite typical that there, there are in the product lines, there are companies who are, who are making the reusable core part and then there are teams who are in a customization projects. So there are then uh, modeling support where core team can make a models. And then we have a number of variant teams who extend the models by core team. So uh, it could be that the language is the same. So there's no domain specificity at all. And here's an example of such uh, example where core team in, a, in this example in a banking makes a, a model. This is just a small model to illustrate the idea that they, they make a core team makes a model and says that there's a loan manager that may have a one or zero accounts. And then this is the core model. And then they give it to the variant team who makes one vari variation product and adds their own stuff. Like for example, reservation list information. And then if the core model changes, let's say uh, uh, this reservation list is added and the core team then changes this model they want to keep the changes back to the variant team without that the variant team uh, needs to start their own extensions from the scratch. So for example, here in this example, the core team changes these models, adds here a close account, which is not yet given here. And also uh, when the model is then updated, the, the variant team's model gets automatically this close account and it also, they also then have their reservation list information. And also if, if the, uh, if the uh, core team removes something, so there was earlier something like ID, if the core team removes it, then it also is removed from the core model from the variant team. But this is nothing to do with the language engineer. This is more like a capabilities of the tools. So if the tools can automatically update variant models, uh, sorry, tools can automatically update changes in the core models uh, in the variant projects. So that the people who make variants, they don't need to uh, maintain or migrate or defend merge manually their they models. But this is now independent of any domain, but it could be, and we are examples of, of that kind of case too, where the domain specific language is, is made so that it says what kind of changes the variation team can do. So for instance, here's the same kind of case, core team has created the model and then the variant team uh, can, can only do certain kind of changes. In, in, the, in the models. They may, for example, uh, uh, add here new attributes. For example, they have added here maximum number of loans. And, and also they may say that the uh, account ID is mandatory. So they change it one to one. But if the core team has then also said that it is already mandatory. Then the tool and the language can show that, look, ID is in core is already set to mandatory. So this kind of change that you have been doing here is does not make any sense. But the domain specific language now restricts better what kind of changes you can do. For instance, maybe you cannot take anything away. You cannot remove the attributes, but you can only change some of the properties. So the domain specific language says what variation teams can do changes in the core models. That's the purpose. 
And the, the last category is what, what, what we call a little bit like a multi-level modeling, where, where uh, domain engineers create a model, which actually becomes a meta model for the language. So here is an example from uh, Internet of Things device, where, where the, the team adds here orientation polling sensor, which can have uh, four values as enumeration values in orientation. And then this language is then given for the <clears throat> uh, teams who are modeling, and then they can add here orientation and choose orientation direction based on the values given here. So a model in one team becomes the meta model for another team. But these kind of cases are more advanced and we, we, we are aware of only very few cases of who are doing this kind of thing. But in academia, this multi-level modeling is also one research uh, subject. We have not found that much actually use, at least among the, the cases we are aware. Maybe it's just a less than a handful among all the cases. So uh, where, how these languages are then defined and how we found out the language concepts. Uh, based on our experience, uh, the, the language definition st starts always by domain engineering, that we, we identify what kind of abstractions there are needed, what are the key concepts they should be and which level our language should operate. So what is the variation level that the language should operate? And once we know what are the variation concepts, uh, then uh, we should somehow formalize it. And the best way to formalize it is, is to specify it in some kind of a meta model. So meta model enforces us to formally define the language. And if you are using here tools, then we can try out this as well immediately. So it's not something in a, just in a pen and paper, but we can run and execute it. Just like I, I was doing this long pressing button policy, for instance, we change the meta model and let's try it out. And then we can ask opinion from colleagues that is this something that, that they want or is this something that seems to be working? And once we have specified the meta model, we also then need to create some visual notation, concrete syntax for it. So what the model should look like for us as humans when we, when we make them and read them and validate them. And typically, diff, uh, diff, uh, met, typically meta model elements have then different meta model elements may have then representations. Not all meta model elements, but the, usually most of them have, have some visualization immediately in the diagrams or matrices or tables or trees or whatever they might be. And then once we have done these three steps, we can try out the language, we can make a models. And once we have models made, then we can start to define generators because the generators reads the models and then produce some output from the models. And normally, to my knowledge, I, I, I don't know that anybody has created this uh, straightforward from the start step one to step four, but rather that what people are doing, they are doing it iteratively. They pick up the most stable part, make meta model for that, try those stable parts to create the models and produce some code, and then they extend it to meta model with more concepts and try them out again. And this is what the case is that I, I mentioned about Panasonic or Polar or Electrobit, they are doing. They are doing in an iteratively small steps, roughly taking two weeks. But the most critical approach, the most critical step here is, is, is not the meta model or, or, or generators. The most critical step is that we find out the relevant abstraction. That what kind of aspects we are modeling. And the closer we are with the, with the variation, 
the 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 better the better the language usually is there. And uh, we also uh, have analyzed among cases that how companies seem to be identifying language concepts, where these language concepts come from. And we wrote another uh, paper and a book about how to identify language concepts. And we found out five different approaches that companies seem to be giving. So what we did was exactly the same than in the previous paper, we picked another 20 plus cases where the problem domain was different. They were generating different kind of code. And then we tried to, to find out that how and why they were picking these language concepts. And in a certain cases were such that the domain concepts already existed. So it was already known somewhat stable domain. So for example, this case that you see here is a case in an insurance. So the, the, the insurance experts, insurance product experts already were speaking and known concepts like uh, risks, accidents, payments, bonuses, and so forth. So such a vocabulary already existed. Maybe not in a formal enough, but it was already at the, at the level of, of abstraction that was suitable for expressing, for example, insurance products. And this kind of abstractions are, are quite often uh, describing the static structures. And they are quite easy then to implement by external people because they are quite, uh, quite simple in terms of, of, of what uh, how, how these models and specifications should be read. So they are typically like a static data models. Another class of domain specific languages where something that we could easily derive from the, from the expected output. And these kind of languages are not good in that respect that the abstraction level is level of output. So the modeling language is mostly visualizing, not necessarily the problem or the variation, but the modeling language is visualizing the expected output. Like the CPL example I had earlier shown, this CPL generates XML and the expected XML is exactly the same than the modeling language over here with the exception that there is this sub action for reusing things. So if you look this uh, 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 call processing as an example over here, and if, if it generates then CPL, you can, ah, you can see that it goes to the this kind of structure. So it's almost like taking the, the XSD, uh, the schema of XML, and then taking each uh, schema element as a modeling concept in the language. Plus having the, ha having of course here the rules that how, what kind of connections are, are possible and so forth. But these kind of languages are bad in that respect that that uh, they don't raise the abstraction. Then the, the, the third step of language was something where the physical structure or loop uh, seems to be having a heavy influence on what the models look like. My first motivating example of the fish farm was exactly like that because the location of ponds is the same as it should be in the location in the real physical world. Or if we have a uh, railway interlocking design, but each station has different interlocking code. And we have a domain specific language for interlocking product lines. Uh, there are companies who do these kind of uh, uh, systems. Uh, 
the, the, the physical structure, how the tracks look like in a station is how the domain specific language looks like and where the language concepts come from. And these are nice because they are easy to identify and, 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 and uh, distinct because we can easily map things in the model. The model mimics the real world. And then the, the, the fourth approach was more like a look and feel. Uh, like in the polar digital, uh, polar sports computer, we have the navigation flow that you press this button and you go. Also here we have this kind of uh, infotainment system where you have a, a, a buttons that you press or, or rollating knobs that you rotate and then you can go further. So each, each uh, UI element or widget comes property of your modeling language. And we have found these kind of languages uh, uh, typical for all kinds of embedded UIs. The, the Panasonic example that I, I demonstrated or showed uh, was also clearly such a language where the navigation in the user interface is shown. And then the last category that we, we identified was, was uh, pure variation space. So the language is built based on the idea that what varies from one product line member to another. And the language only describes what is varying. And all what is common, we, we don't express. So this is a, this is a classical uh, product line languages. And these kind of languages are often considered hard because they are not easy to see. Plus, people are a little bit scary about defining a language if, they, if the variability is changing in future. So some people might think that building a new language is, is, is so difficult that they, I don't want to do it, especially if, if in the next project it's going to change. But thanks to the meta model based tools, you can quite easily change and extend the variation with, that your language captures. Just like I was trying to demonstrate with the long pressing button policy, that even though we have an existing language, even existing products made with that language available, we can still continue and, and tackle richer variability space by extending uh, the language. So uh, the next, what we would do is we would inspect the variability modeling in more detail. And I would go back to this uh, product line case, but uh, to run in, in, in schedule, even though we don't have a common coffee break now, but we should have a virtual coffee break and I understood that it should be a, a half an hour break. So uh, Irish time, two o'clock, we continue. Or, or one o'clock, uh, sorry, uh, three o'clock uh, Central European time. So uh, let's, let's come back and uh, I'll, I'll stop the uh, recording or pause the recording for that. So let's continue after half an hour. And if you have any questions, feel, wild, feel free to, to use the chat tool or, or consider your questions and we can then tackle them and try to answer them once we come back from the break. Or if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now as well. That's fine as well. Okay, let's have a coffee then. Yeah, I think 
we will go back in half an hour. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your coffee. So let's get back then to the topic, and I, I hope you had a good coffee break. We'll continue next with the language creation steps for how to define a language for our particle example, which we had here, uh, the, the digital uh, wristwatch. So the typical approach is that uh, we do a domain engineering, a conduct a domain analysis to look what are the key concepts and we identify what things are variation. And usually we then also create some kind of uh, uh, abstract concepts or model or data model uh, that what, what the domain looks like. So in, in our case of the digital wristwatch, we could create this kind of a domain model where we say that within a product line of digital wristwatches, every single watch product contains of one logical watch and one display unit. One display unit contains zero to four icons, two to four buttons, and shows one to four display zones. And each logical watch application may contain other applications, it shows time and makes some kind of actions. And <clears throat> uh, there can be alarms and it can show icons and actions get activated by buttons. And time contains of four time units that are shown in a display zone. So we create this kind of abstract conceptual model. What is the, the watch about and what is its variation points? And then the task for language engineers is that how, how we can capture the essential concept of the domain with some kind of a domain specific language. And within our example of digital wristwatch, where we have this meta model uh, defined over here for the structure part. And when we model it with this uh, example, we can cover large portion of this variation already. So here, if you look at this meta model, it says that we have one uh, watch product. Here's an instance of it. Here's one watch product, and it has one logical watch and one display. So it covers this part. And then each display contains icons, buttons, display zones covering this part. And in, in this uh, way, the language specifies exactly what we think that the uh, watch products, watch uh, display structures, structural aspects could be. And, and the same kind of thing we then also do for, the, for this uh, uh, application part that deals with the, uh, with the state machine you, you saw earlier. So uh, this part of the logical watch uh, with times, alarms, is, is illustrated here with the state transition. So we have a previously shown state transitions between states, and there can be one start state, multiple stop states. Uh, the actions can deal with icons and alarms and can set the variable time. And by using these two languages, we can then express all different kind of uh, variant products within the digital wristwatch. But then we also have aspects in this uh, meta model that do not cover all the details over here. Uh, for instance, there is usually the minimum cardinally kind of things like we have here the rule saying that uh, each digital wristwatch display should have two buttons at, at minimum. But in our meta model, we don't normally say that because it is impossible then to create a model with a, with a display if it doesn't have immediately two buttons, which we have not yet defined. So these kind of uh, rules are normally then put into additional constraints that are checked 
uh, at, at the modeling time. So for instance, I, I'll use here an old example from, from Porsche car, where this is the, the type of display uh, that the cars had 10 years ago, and then they could have a modeling language. But if you are making illegal connections here, connecting these elements, the language can say that, look, you cannot make such a model for, for, for some reason. So it checks the, 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 the rules that we, are, we have there. So the domain specific language is not only saying that what are your keywords, what are your modeling elements, but it also shows all the ways how you can use those modeling elements. So <clears throat> therefore the meta model normally always cover these rules as well. And this is very important from, for the product derivation. So if we want to generate products, we want to generate code, then the models must be uh, uh, correct so that they are, they are adequate input for code generators. And the more we can put to the, these domain rules to the language, the normally the better it is because uh, we can then detect errors early on or even prevent errors to happen in the first place. And as we know, the earlier we can prevent the errors, the, the, the cheaper it becomes Com compared to the approach that we are generating a bad code and then we need to correct that later on. And these uh, language rules can be such that <clears throat> they can be very uh, strict part of the meta model, like, like you saw here over here, that if I want to do something illegal, the, the language immediately checks that no, you, you cannot even create such a model. But in some cases, you, you may want to, or you are forced to allow people to create illegal models like incomplete models. So they are model data, but we don't know yet what the model data is, but the language user should know that that data is missing. Or maybe the model is not consistent yet, but keep, keep continue, continue modeling, but come and, and solve the problems later on. So if, it's, if the rules are part of the meta model, it's, it's a better because then they are really, really followed and they are followed early on. But <clears throat> quite often people want to say that, uh, yeah, yeah, I know, but I want still for reason that and that, I want to have a flexibility here. And the, the uh, rules can be put visible on very different uh, manner. And that was also uh, one of the questions that uh, Pin uh, Monica Pinto was asking during the, during the break that how to check these constraints possibly between multiple languages, multiple meta models on different levels like hardware or, 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 or software levels. Uh, so these uh, rules are, are visible can be made visible during the modeling action. So each time you do something, the rules can be checked and then showed is, is this uh, status correct? Or the rules can be such that they allow people to continue, but they just tell that something is not, not bad. Or maybe the, uh, the uh, status of the model, possible errors, like in most ID tools, when you, uh, they are they are showed somewhere in the separate window, separate uh, model check window, and not in the main modeling space where you are creating your specifications. Or maybe you even add to your uh, modeling language uh, uh, capabilities that just like, let's say when you are writing text in a word and you have a typo, you get the underlining there, but in this this sentence, this word has a problem. You can do the same with the modeling languages that if there's something wrong in an element, that element can be, have an icon to, to mark that something is, is missing. And then these uh, checks can be executed at, at different times. You, you could be that uh, you don't, you only run them when, when a person wants to check them. This is in particle if the model is very, very large 
or multiple people are editing the model at the same time. So it could take a lot of time if, let's say, 100,000 model elements are checked when you add something in your model. So maybe a certain things you want to only check when the, you think that it's time now to check my model. Or maybe there are certain type of things like mandatory name is something that you really need to want to check immediately. Or maybe the check is something that you cannot generate the code if it founds errors. So the code generation doesn't proceed. Or, or uh, you, you run a model checking when you provide a review report for your team. But in the, top of, in the beginning of the review report, you have a list of all those topics that, uh, that need to be covered. Or before, before you put it to version control, you run a check. And uh, only if it passed checks, only then uh, the, 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 these, uh, the, the, the versioning can proceed. And related to the question that you can, I guess, see in the chat tool, there was a question about how to, how to express constraints between different kinds of models. In the example, there was a, a, an issue that if a, if a task is deployed in a device, but the device does not have capabilities to do that. So I have a little bit that kind of a example in a, in a, in a heat, heating kinds of system. So I have here a structural aspect that describes what are my elements in my heating system. And, and then I may have a behavioral element uh, that describes, for example, how the, in this case, how the heat controller uh, is behaving in which conditions. So there are two, two separate uh, models over here. But <clears throat> if I then keep adding here, let's say I add here uh, uh, pump 23 and, and say that I only uh, uh, take this pump off when we are in this stage. I can go then to my, my high level design and run a checker. And now this checker is shown here at the separate screen that this is my system design, but somewhere in my system design, there is a, a pump B23. Which, uh, which is defined over here, but actually it's not part of my system at all. So I may have different uh, languages. So this is the, the behavior, uh, this is the structural language just describing the connection of pipe instruments. And then here is the actual applications that operate in this uh, uh, pipe and, uh, uh, and instrument uh, structure. So they can be separate checks uh, being executed here and showed then here immediately at the, at the modeling time. And depend on the actions, there can be different kind of uh, checks. And these checks can be again domain specific. For instance, uh, this is a flow sensor uh, that uh, indicates the, the flow. But if I, for some reason, I, I, I remove one pipe connection, then I get the comp, uh, uh, error notification that, uh, that this flow sensor has only one connection, two is needed. But if I have a temperature sensor, the temperature sensor is happy with one connection only because I don't need, uh, for measuring temperature, I don't need to have something that passes me through like the flow sensor. So these are examples of domain specific constraints that deal with dedicated uh, uh, language concepts. And therefore I can, I can make temporarily illegal designs, but uh, I, I, I'm aware that it should be covered. Obviously much better is that if, it, if I can prevent in the meta model already, that if I want to connect this, uh, let's say this, uh, burner with this pump and the pump already has a connection 
uh, then this shouldn't be allowed to done. Maybe I have I had changed the meta model for this <laughs> this demonstration that this is allowed. This obviously shouldn't be allowed because there's connection. I have using this for demonstration uh, earlier. But uh, the best is that the language checks that what kind of things are are legal to be connected. So now it gets me bothered that it, it didn't work. So, so there are rules in the meta model which says which kind of things can be connected and how. And uh, and and illegal ones are not are not allowed. So that's the obvious, the best one. But if you don't, we can then have these rules checked as a separate uh, constraint checkings. And how these are, are, are checked then depends completely of the of the domain rules. Uh, this also, this uh, example that I, I had here also a little bit illustrates the next topic of concrete syntax. So this is a heating system and it uses uh, existing standard for, for uh, piping and instrumentation. And this language is tried to be made so that uh, it mimics those that standard closely. Like for example, if this is a, a manual valve with a closing by ball, it, it shows this way, but if it's a butterfly, it, it, it varies because this is how people in the piping and instrumentation are get used to these kind of drawings. So it's very important that the model looks something that people already, uh, already know. And <clears throat> this is comes to then to the topic of concrete syntax, how, how our models should look like. So once we have defined the, the meta model, the, the next thing is that we should think how to how to visualize things. And code generators doesn't normally care what, what the model looks like. It reads the model data be, be beneath there. But for, for humans who are creating these models, or even more who are reading and validating these models, for, for them it's important that, uh, that the models are, are uh, readable and easy to understand. And the, uh, the, the best guidance that we can give is, is based on the work by, by Daniel uh, Moody on physics of notation, where, where he says that when we create the notations, they should use a uh, full scope of uh, visual variables for our uh, notation, so that our notation should use, for example, different kind of shapes. It should not be that all are rectangles, but, or like in the bad case of UML stereotyping, that all are rectangles with stereotype label, meaning different things. It's much better that they are different shapes, sizes, colors, textures, brightness, or, or orientation kind of thing, or they have some kind of uh, position information that they, they bring. Because then it makes models more easier to, to, to understand. And like shown with the railway system, it's good if it uh, uses existing uh, visualizations. So we don't need to create them from the scratch, but uh, we can create them from the, based on the uh, existing notation, something like what the, what, for example, the user interface guys over here did, that there's a display and there are certain regions and these maps to easy to understand. So if we, if it mimics the real world, uh, mimics the visualizations people are already now using, maybe it's just in a PowerPoint or VC or in a, in, or in a wallpaper or somewhere, but if it's something that they already know, that's, uh, that's a good thing. And also if you are in charge of creating the language or defining the meta model, you may even ask some of your users to define the notation. So they can say what it should look like because they are using the language. And this is also a good way to, to get the language users involved. And if the language users can be involved, then it becomes their language. 
and as we often know, if 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 we, if it's if people are involved in creating it, uh, it it is much better. They are much better accepting its use because it's their language now. But we should not only make the language for those who are creating the models, because usually we are reading the models much more than creating them. And those readers are usually other kind of people than just those who are modeling it. So with the, with the case of a heating system, for instance, there could be guys who install it, or there could be customers who can, uh, who can say that I, I don't want to have, uh, I, I want to have more radiators, or that is not that kind of valve or whatever that might be. And there can be also a uh, miniature and in the software side, we have a test engineers and so forth. So there's much more different type of audience who are reading it. So if the models are easier for them to read, then they are better involved and they can uh, communicate. So to, to somehow summarize the, the, what kind of things are needed is that we, we should try to avoid style which is applied in, in UML stereotyping. For example, if we want to find out what is the input concept, we need to read every text here to find out that, oh, it's this one. Compared to if we have ideally what is a, a pictogram, or if you think about graphic signs, if you have that kind of pictogram style, it's much more easy to see, oh, this is the person and this is the input or button on display. Of course, we could use also the photos but then we would think about other things uh, than the actual design things. Plus there wouldn't be space for entering the design information that the model should carry. So if you design the notation, uh, try to, to think about pictograms or, or, or traffic signs as a, as a kind of a metaphor. And you may also borrow the, the guidelines directly from your corporate documentation standards. And, uh, and uh, even though it's easy to uh, build very uh, uh, eye candy graphics, they, they in the longer run, uh, they could, in the longer run, they don't anymore give a benefit. Only maybe in the beginning that it looks nice, but afterwards uh, it's not so relevant. And you may also then use not, uh, notation for, for other aspects than just for showing the pure design information. Quite often, most modeling languages only show what you enter there, but it would be also good if the language, for example, could show uh, what is a missing or, or what is the default values when it's not used or elements not connected, or maybe provide a guidance that uh, a certain elements may, may, may need further aspects or is reused or requires a submodel and, and so forth. So that kind of thing helps people then to, to read. And of course, you may also think about different kinds of concrete syntaxes. So uh, I have been using here mostly uh, graphical, but they could be like a matrices or tables or, or just the lists or even uh, uh, texts and, and different kind. And uh, when we have a models, um, the, the examples that I was showing on, on six ways to handle variation and in all but the first one, we deal also in information about reusing the models. Quite typically, uh, it is easy to think about domain-specific languages that we make models for one variant only. But uh, then we normally try to find out that uh, we need to reuse specifications made for other cases. And uh, then, then uh, by analyzing what kind of models we have done, we can then extend the modeling language capabilities 
so that they also support reuse at different level. I could reuse the whole diagram, like in the watch example, or I could, I could just reuse partial elements made, single objects made in other uh, designs. So uh, we have still a, a, a time for actual uh, product derivation. So even though the domain specific models allow us to express variation, it is uh, maybe the productive improvement comes also largely from the fact that the models are not only for communication and discussion, but we can use those models as a basis to, to produce product variants. And uh, for that purpose, the, the last step for defining domain specific languages after finding the abstraction levels, meta model and generators is to is to define uh, meta models and notations is to is to define the code generators and what the code generators uh, do is that uh, they basically navigate the model structures and the navigation is is guided strictly by the meta model so depending on what kind of model elements we have we can navigate in those structures and we extract information from the model and then translate it to, to the format that the code uses in some output formats. One way to think about code generators is to think about it like a advice in a tra when traveling in a city with a map, that model is like the map and the code generator travels you go into this map and you travel in the streets and while you are traveling there, you see things and you can take that with you and translate that to some output format. So basically what code generator do is it crawls in the model structure, extracts the pieces that you want from those models and put it to some output format and possibly translate it so that if someone has entered into model values that are not suitable as such directly in, in your output, you can uh, translate them. A classical example is that someone enters a state name with the white spaces, but you translate them to underscores so that you can use the names they give as variable names or other parts of your code. So there are multiple ways to then to how, how code generator works. And, and if you look first, the crawling and navigation part. So uh, quite typical approach is that we have some kind of model structure, and then we have there some key element like a start element or something. And the, and the code generator navigates there. Uh, the, the structure, maybe if there are any of these nodes has a sub model, you can then decide whether it goes depth first or breadth first uh, to navigate. The code generator may also uh, uh, say that it, it takes and crawls it based on certain objects that they have, that only certain kind of objects, like in my example, blue rectangles are, are, are generated first and then, then the others. Or maybe the code generator doesn't care about objects at all. It just looks that give me all the certain type of connections, relations between elements and produce them and so forth. So it's up to you fully to decide how the crawling and accessing model elements goes there. And then the, the, the generated code can look uh, very different kind depending on your or your needs. Uh, one aspect that uh, I hope became clear from the from the start with the examples that with domain specific languages we we normally don't generate all the code. So you usually always have some uh, common code for your product lines that uh, that is not generated; it's already there, and you just integrate with that. 
So for example, I mentioning that in the case of, of Polar Electro, they said that half of the code is, is common for all product line members like battery management. So there's no need to build a domain specific language for, for describing such uh, 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 single implemented capability. So it's better to do the, the language for the variation part. And what to generate is then uh, conditioned by the meta model. So we can obviously only generate stuff that we have as a basis in the model. And if something is missing, if we can't generate something what we want, then we need to consider that should we extend the meta model or maybe it's something that we don't want to model at all and we put to the existing uh, uh, commonality path. And I, I would like to show some basic code generator structures following the navigation uh, next. So I have here three different kind of examples uh, where different kind of uh, code generation capabilities are applied. So what the first one is a, is a code generator where we don't have really much, much uh, framework at all. Uh, this is a language for um, that, that uh, this is a kind of system that we normally hate. We call somewhere and then there's a loudspeaker saying press one, press two and, and, and continue. So there's a company which makes these kind of uh, systems and uh, and in this loudspeaker there is specified in more detail uh, the the menu. This is the uh, voice menu language, and the loudspeaker is uh, symbol is detailed with with the voice output in that loudspeaker. And here this language has a clear start and stop concepts, so the code generator basically starts from this start element and then starts to navigate. And if it finds out uh, the um, sub model, then it continues there. So if I run this uh, uh, assembler code generator, you can basically see the, the type of code what is produced from this model. So this is like a flow oriented. Uh, model. And the other example was the example of a heating system. So here comes one file, one assembler file. Then there's a heating system, which is a, a system where we have a parallel instruments, multiple instruments are executed at the same time. So like a distributed system. And here, different uh, systems like this uh, heating controller is one system, and uh, the uh, pump is another system. And I noticed that uh, uh, related to the question made in the chat tool, uh, this example also had this capability that uh, if we have defined here, uh, this is the structure of the system. And if we have here defined a behavior and the behavior includes now pump 23, but it is not part of the whole system design. We are running here a check that reports that this P23 is here and it's, it's somehow involved in a control loop, but it is actually not part of the system at all. So we get the warning over here as a constraint, even though this meta model is for structure part, and this is for, uh, for the dynamic part. And <clears throat> before I generate the code, I should obviously delete this, uh, this one so that I, 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 I don't have any warnings now. So I can now generate the code. And if I run here the code, this code generator 
now produce me this uh, PLC code for different parts of the system. And, uh, and this is now the uh, IEC 61131 PLC code. And here you can see the, the, the logic that is taken from the state machines over here. So in this case, the code come from the state machine for to this structure. And the, the, uh, the last example or that I had here is the, the digital wristwatch that you already saw where we have these kind of uh, watch applications and, and then we can generate the code uh, in, in different structures and execute it. We already executed the, the C sharp code here, but here is also the, the C code for, for this application. Uh, with the exception <clears throat> that we modified this meta model before the break, that this is a long pressing button policy. So <clears throat> obviously our code generator doesn't know about long pressing button policy because we just changed this meta model. And in order to also make this flow uh, language definition steps uh, complete, we should also add here the notation. So I only added here long pressing event, but it would be also good to, to show here somehow for the, for the people that who are reading these models that uh, <clears throat> this button is, is uh, this uh, button pressing is long pressing policy. So I update this uh, and give a, uh, give a notation for it. And let's show this ellipse only when it's a long pressing button policy. So this is a long pressing button policy and, uh, and uh, this one is a long pressing button policy. But here, here I don't have it unless I, I specify so. But when I run our generator, my generator doesn't know about long pressing button policy. So the real, real way to do code generators is that we would ask first the uh, the uh, the developer, usually the the framework developer or experienced developer or best programmer in the company. That well, what the code should look like when you are writing it manually what the code should look like if it is a long pressing button policy. And then if the person can say that the, the, the uh, long pressing button policy is, is uh, like here, if I press the uh, mode button, it, it, should, it should be something like just for, for simplicity, I, I would say, oh, it, it should have a capital string long mode. It, it, in real world, it should be something different, but just for now demonstration purposes that someone says that what the code should look like. And if, if someone can say what the code should look like, then we can change the code generator to produce this kind of code. And uh, in this case, to, to implement uh, C code generator for this long pressing button policy here, uh, I could then update my, my generator. So I had here these three code generators and one uh, acceptance testing generator. So here I can see my C code generator and somewhere here, I should, I should add my long pressing button policy code. So if, if uh, event is long press, so I can access the meta model. And here you can see, I can only make my code generator to navigate in the concepts that I have expressed in my met models. So if I don't have something in a model, it doesn't make sense to build a generator to access that data either. 
So e only if it's a long <clears throat> event has a long press, then we should show something like in my <clears throat> naive example, uh, capital uh, long. And uh, that's that's what we would like to show. Oops, and classical typo <clears throat> missing. And now we could run this code generator to see whether this 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 works. So just for debugging purposes, uh, I'll, I'll run the code generator to see whether my C code now recognizes the long, long pressing button policy. So at the, at the moment we are here in the lap time and uh, we are pressing the, the, the button in this transition. So now it should produce me a long followed by the button, button name, which is in this case down button. And, and continue. So the code generator is here, and this is the produced output. So now, if my company's best programmer says that this is what it should look like, the code, then we have a code generator that now produces the code as the uh, as as it was expected. So if we can write the code manually, then we can try to say to the code generator what the code should should look like. So how to design a code generator? Uh, if, if we try to make a generator so that uh, it tries to handle all the possible cases, then it, it will be very difficult. But the key part why code gener making code generators is uh, significantly easier here is that we only need to make a code generator for digital wristwatch fish farm, uh, automotive infotainment system, sports computer. We don't need to cover all the possible cases. And then the making generators will be significantly easier. So we need to only happy, we only need to make our company happy. We don't need to make everybody happy. So if you are using tools like uh, Simulink or LabVIEW, they make a general purpose generators. So they, they want to also satisfy needs uh, from uh, many, many different companies. So here the situation is easier. And then the other approach here is that when we make the generator or implement the generator, we try to make the generated code complete so that uh, we don't need to touch the generated code at all. And if we would need to change the generated code, then we would need to ask ourselves that why we need to change the code. And if we know how we, why and how we change the code, then we change the generator instead. And, and as, a, as a result, there's no uh, problems of maintaining the uh, models manually or semi-automatically with, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the implementation you did. So there's no reverse engineering or no such uh, uh, issues needed at all. The code generation is complete uh, in the same manner when like you are compiling your code. You don't change the assembler code that you can see uh, during the compilation process, even though that the tools allow you to show see that code. Ah, awesome code. And uh, the languages should operate at the uh, highest possible level that you can still make the, the, the code generator and also the language should follow the domain rules. Because if, if you allow, if you don't have rules in your language, then you still need to check them before you have the code. And in some cases we have seen that people write then very, very complex code generators that first check the model that it is correct before actual code generation can start. But if you have those rules in the model, in the, in, sorry, we have the rules in the meta model, then we already know that the starting point for the code generation process is easier. And, uh, and then making the code generators are also uh, simpler. And then also 
on the guidelines on designing a code generator, uh, it is also good to try to generate as little as possible. We have some cases where companies are very happy to say that, look, we are generating tens of thousands of lines of code or hundreds of thousands of lines of code, and that's a great thing. But <clears throat> if we see a repetition there a lot, that the same structures are, are, are repeating, it doesn't make sense to, to have a complex code generator to produce the same kind of things, multiple lines. It's better to move those similarities back to the common parts, as we all know in a product line, and, and then put those commonalities to the underlying framework. And then we, the code generator only calls those uh, uh, commonalities uh, from existing code. Another good advice is also trying to keep the generator modular. One good practice is that for each domain concept, you will have own code generator or piece of code generator. So if I have, a, for example, a <clears throat> code generator for uh, alarm in my digital watch or code generator for updating the display, then if the domain concept changes, I have a, a respective generator module that I need to change. And there are also other approaches that you can structure your code generator, like one generator or set of generators per file to be generated. Or if you have a similar uh, subroutines among generators, you put them into subgenerators that you can reuse. And it is also good to show readable code. So in the examples I, I'll, I'll showed, we, we generate uh, good looking code, or at least we generate the same kind of code people have been writing manually in the past. So I don't know if you think that this is a good looking code. Some people would maybe say that this, this isn't, but if this is exactly what people are writing now manually, and we, can, we, we have then a generator that produced the code as it looks like now, then the one, one uh, big afraid disappears from the people who may have tried out generators in the past, meaning that they have used a code generator and then when they have inspected generated code, it has looked uh, um, difficult to understand and hard to maintain. But if the generated code looks like what they are writing today, then, uh, then they are happy. Mentally, they are happy because if they don't even want to use the generator, they have still their code left. And the code is in the level that they can maintain. So it's a little bit like a, like a fire door uh, uh, opportunity or fire door capability that they are not afraid about using generators now because because they don't do anything special. They, they understand what they are doing. Another aspect of why, why the generative code should be good looking is that then also when, when the person who makes the generator, uh, it's also easier for, for the person then to, to maintain the generator if the, if the code is uh, readable and easy to, to understand. And it is also common that we have a existing code. So we don't generate all the code. Uh, in the Assembler example, we were largely generating all the code. We didn't have any special libraries directly. In the CPL, we had, uh, we just produced XML by following the schema. So there is existing servers that read that schema. But quite often there is a situation that we have existing legacy code or framework code, and we need to integrate the generated code with the existing uh, code. So here are some approaches that, that are, can be applied to integrate the generated code. So here we have a high level model that produces the generated code, the, the white fillet boxes. And then we have existing legacy or manual code in these blue boxes. So the most typical approach is that, that uh, the generative code then uses or calls uh, services from the existing 
framework. Just like when we are writing code manually, we can we can then uh, call a function from the library. Or we could do a weak version, but that's not a common. Another approach uh, that is that uh, is that we are using uh, the capabilities of the target language. In this case, the object orientation that we have a manually written uh, superclasses, and then we are generating subclasses filling the, the the template that the superclasses provide. Or or we could do it also weak versa, but that's not common. Then depending on the programming languages, there are languages like C sharp, which provides a concept of partial class. A, a, a single class can be partially manually written and partly generated and the C, class, C sharp itself provides such a concept and capability that is not uh, typically in, in other programming languages. And then another, another approach is that we have existing manually written code and inside that manually written code, we might we write marks and the code generator reads those marks and fills there the data as the code generator says that if it finds a mark one, it knows what to put to the mark one. If it finds mark two, it knows what they take from the model to mark two and so forth. And the, the, the final approach is what, what people call the protected regions or protected blocks in which the code generator is, is made so that it, uh, it calculates the checksums so that when you generate the code, you have regions in your generated code where you can write your, your manual extensions. And when, when you then regenerate, you change the model and regenerate, those manual extensions are not, are not overwritten, but they stay there. And the typical approach is that the more you can go here on the left side, that you can cleanly, you can keep the generated code and manual written code totally separate. Uh, that is uh, uh, better and, and scales better. But compared to the approaches here on the on the right side, because sooner or later, and unfortunately quite often sooner, someone writes the code outside the protected regions, and then in the next code generation, wonders where is my code. So this kind of approach, where you where you use language structures and you keep them totally separate, it works works better. But of course, if you have, if you follow strictly the routines and maybe smaller teams, then this can also work. So there's a multiple options, uh, options to do. And code generators are not only about, about generating the, the code only or the variants, which, which I, was, I was showing here. We can use the code generators also for many, many other uh, purposes. Uh, model checking, for instance, is, is one uh, typical area. We can use it for, uh, for uh, configuration or, or generate tests uh, for, the, for the cases. I had, for example, here for, for this case that you, you saw, there is a uh, 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 Kerkin cucumber tests also generated for acceptance from this same model. So it supports then the same model with different code generator then supports testing needs. Or we, we have a generator that builds the whole chain from auto build that you, you basically saw when we were animating the models. So when we executed the digital wristwatch, I only pressed once auto build and it compiles the code, calls the compiler, uh, co produce the files, calls the compiler, starts the emulator, 
and even starts to debug and animate the models while we are running it. But I don't need to do any, any actions there. It's all, all basically automated. But also we can produce many, many other kind of artifacts. And quite often these, these artifacts like installation guidance or help texts, review documents, reports, they are something that usually people don't enjoy writing, but they, they can be quite easily, much more easier produced than, than the code. So therefore, people are usually happy if they get this kind of situation that I showed in the beginning, that we have a high level model and then we can produce all kinds of outputs from this model. And, and, and we can say to the team that you don't need to write any documents, for example, anymore, or any configuration files, or, or use time to keep these in sync. But they all come from the, from the same, same source. So these kind of things are usually uh, easy to do, somehow low hanging fruits, but of course better if you can generate the actual products uh, from these models as well. I mentioned also about the, the effort that this doesn't come for free. It requires an investment to build the domain specific language, but Based on the data we have, the, the investment is, is modest. It's uh, surprisingly small. So it's normally something like uh, two weeks, two uh, working weeks. So it's not a man year, man month project. It can take in a calendar maybe months, but uh, actual work to, to, to implement it based on the industry cases, which I, I showed, uh, speaks about uh, roughly two weeks. And if, we can, if you can do such a language, then the productivity gains within the product line are, are quickly paid off and you, you can meet the return of the investment very fast. So to, to summarize uh, what domain specific languages are doing is that they focus on capturing the variation within a product line, but they are far better approaches than parameter tables or decision trees or feature models because the various variation space is a bigger, it can, it can capture aspects like uh, uh, execution order, for instance, which is very hard to show with, let's say, feature models. It also means that uh, with the domain specific language, you can allow your engineers to innovate and create new kind of variants, still restricted in the variation space as set by the meta model. And Domain specific languages are widely applied in practice. Uh, I think they are, in terms of product derivation, they are much more applied than the product lines. Uh, sorry, much more applied than the feature modeling. Even though there's a lot of research done in, in SPLC community for feature modeling, but in terms of actually using them to produce product variants, they are not so used unlike domain specific languages. And if you are moving to build your domain specific languages, the best way to do those and create them is an incrementally and in a small steps, starting from the stable variation and then show quickly to the rest of the organization how it works so that they can, they can see the benefits immediately and then extend the language uh, uh, further. And there's a lot of tools available I, I, I was showing this uh, metadata tool where I, the, in the company I work, and with this particle tool, the development effort varies in the different industry cases one, from one to three weeks. 
And the, the nicest part that people have normally said about building the automation is that it's, it's, it's a, it is a great fun for experts because uh, they are not only building a single variant, single product, but they are actually building all product future in, in future to come. So they say that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great fun. So it's a five o'clock. Was this supposed to be ending at the five o'clock, I, I think? But uh, there was some questions in the, in the chat, which we can discuss. But I would be more than interested to, to hear about uh, any questions you may have, any, any comments, or if you have your experiences doing something similar, I would be very keen on hearing them. And I also would be hearing about any counter arguments or things like that uh, when not to create domain specific languages. So, uh, Please, you can just uh, open the microphone and we can have a have a more detailed discussion. Uh, I, I have, I don't know if it is a question, a reflection or something. Mm -hmm. uh, it's related to my previous question. I, I was thinking, uh, I mean, I, I'm working on creating a meta model to be able to represent a all the language constructs that we can find in different feature modeling approach, not in the, not only the basic ones, but, you know, cardinality, clonable, there are many, many different constructs. Mm, yes. So our group is working on trying to develop a modular meta model so you can pick those characteristics that you need in, in every moment. So when you were discussing or explaining your tool, uh, I have a question. It would be possible to have a, a meta model focusing only on typical feature modeling elements, and then to have extensions of that meta model to represent, for instance, in a net computing system. You have the deployment, you have the, the devices, you have the tasks, and you need to to provide richer models because you don't only want to model the variability but also the interaction or the relationship between tasks that it doesn't have nothing to do with variability so to, to have three levels the meta modeling level another model, meta modeling level with concept specific from this um, hardware or software or deployment models and then the model of your app for instance edge a system or IoT system. I don't know if I explain. So a combination of three kind of uh, Yeah, languages. but basically using uh, all the concept that we already have in feature modeling. Mm -hmm. So that then, for instance, using your code generator, I will be able to generate a model to be able to use some analysis techniques already existing, I mean, I use some kind of tool focusing on the domain model, but then I want to combine the, I, I want to, at the end, I want to generate a variability model so I can use the rest of tools that there is on the community to do the analysis or optimization or any other kind of things that we usually do with a feature model. Yeah, I think, the part that should be easy is the generating the output in a structure in other tools, but the <coughs> other tools may have very many different formats. Yeah. But then you have then own generator for each tool format. The, the, the other question is then the, maybe the, the main question, if I understood correctly, is that we, we may have a simple meta model like illustrated over here. And then we may, we may have another more richer meta model for more complex state machine, uh, for more complex feature model. Like, yes, like even, yeah, and, even and, a, and, and then yes. them, and then there can be even more and more. Yeah. And the question is that what kind of feature modeling capabilities are needed 
in a particle product line? It was this a question. <coughs> yeah, I was thinking on, for instance, if I am modeling an edge computing system, I don't need to know nothing about variability, but variability mm -hmm. is there. So I create a meta model based on the domain concept of edge system or IoT system, yeah. but then be, uh, in the bottom of that meta model, there is a variability with meta, meta model. In the, in the terms that we understand in feature modeling. I mean, I have all, all this meta model that you, are, that you are showing in this slide, but I have uh, other ones that are focused only on concepts from the domain. I don't know if probably I'm thinking. Yeah, in yeah, yeah. So, so basically you are saying that you would like to relate feature models with the, with the other modeling languages. Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, that, that's that's also uh, possible and also done with, for example, with with meta mm -hmm. So so there are industry languages like in automotive, automotive industry is looking to to languages like SysML, but but SysML is mo is is originally made for building a single system, whereas most automotive systems are product lines or co or cars are product lines. So for that reason, automotive industry people have created languages where they combine feature models with, <coughs> with the system modeling they are using. Mm -hmm. So languages like eStadial, for example, provide feature model that is linked with the rest of the system model. Yeah, it's something like that. Yeah, yeah. But, they, but they are only doing it in a, in a context of automotive systems. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it, yeah. but but beneath there, beneath there is just a, a, a meta model. Okay, yeah, that's the idea because in the edge computing area is the same. I mean, you need to model some concepts that are not usually present in a variability in a typical or in a feature model. So yeah. you need to combine both the variability part of an element, but also the rest of your model. Otherwise, yes. for the people expert on edge computing. Just using the variability model doesn't make sense. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes. And and while while I mentioned this uh, automotive language, <coughs> they this is their meta model. They they have here a variability part. Yeah. And they also have a uh, let me see. They have the classical yeah. uh, uh, structure, like a hardware, mm -hmm. what the yeah. hardware, hardware structure is. But they also have the, the <coughs> feature model. Let me see where they have it. And the key part is that they link the, the feature model and uh, they link the feature model and uh, They link, the, they link the feature model and system model. Yeah, together. this is exactly what I was talking about. Yes, yeah. and, 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 and related to this linking, they have some, <coughs> they have some standards, like in safety standards, which says that uh, how this linking must be done at minimum. Mm -hmm. Because if it, that's the way how they can they, uh, show for certification that the, the 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 software they have developed is meeting the the minimum safety needs, but that that's that's how they want to to link feature models and uh, and other product aspects together. But I would expect that in in other domains. Uh, what kind of feed, how features are linked to to the system designs vary from domain to domain. Yeah. Yeah, but you can have the mechanisms to relate different domains, and then you just apply them in a different way depending on on the domain. Yeah. Yes. But but beneath, beneath here is just. Uh, a, a language definition in 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 meta mm -hmm. 
and and this is something you what you can uh, what you can do and uh, another aspect uh, what what was discussed in a, in a in a chat tool was also checking the constraints yes so if we have a this is our example of a heating system but this describes the structure of the heating system but we may have also here a behavior this is a, like a state machine and it may also check these models and their consistency together so if if i if i add here something that is not does not make sense or i or maybe it makes sense but uh, I, I make here action to the radiator, but if if the radiator that I added here, air three, if the radiator is not part of this system design at all, it will show me here checks. Yeah, it's not defined. It is not defined, and and this is just now a simple check. It could be something that it's not a venturi pump, and therefore you can't have it or whatever that check could be, but that's a property of this language definition, that how we are, that what kind of constraints we are checking and whether the checks are run between different languages mm -hmm. or models and whether they are, and how they are shown. Like here, they are shown in a classical IDE tool approach that they are shown here at the bottom of the screen that what's 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 missing I know how many errors we may have and can you constrain for instance that if a particular element has some attributes or some properties can you constrain that a value in, in one of these property will impact in the other model because you you won't be able for instance to select from all I mean you have two elements one mm -hmm. in each uh, model each one with attributes and you can, can you establish the constraints at the attribute level? So if I select some values in one of the model, this will restrict what can I do, what I can do with elements in the other model or it is more having an element or not. Yeah, it, it, it can check that if the other value is not correct anymore. So if I, if I, if I change the value over here, it can then check that the value given here is not any more valid. Because it's the same element that you are very used to uh, the or, same or, element in the two models. Or, or, or it can calculate the value, the, the legal legality based on a set of values here. So it doesn't mm -hmm. need to be one to one. <coughs> but there is also this approach that if I understood your question correctly, that if I enter here some value, then in the other model, I can yeah. only I can only give values uh, restricted by this element. Then we have then the cases like multi-level modeling where this, this model becomes a constraint or meta model for this one. But that is not so common that we have we have seen, but I understood your your, yeah. your point. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We we Thank see you. we we see it as a language design. Uh, issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I understand that it is the I mean, it is different from my perspective, because I'm working mainly with feature models and extension of feature model. And this is a different context on so some things cannot be directly translated. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Now I understand. Now I understand the mm -hmm. con context of, of this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So if there if if there is further interest on this, uh, we I have here references for the for the work behind this one particle part of the notations side is the is the Daniel Moody's work mm -hmm. and uh, also the, <laughs> the the original work that we know on building domain specific languages for product lines is is 
over 20 years old from from Lucent, I think. Lucent was the uh, David Weiss and, and Robert Light. Yeah. yeah, I have the slide. I will take a look to the references. Yes, yes, yes. They, they provide their uh, uh, detailed steps how to build a domain specific language and, and related tooling. Yes, I, I have some knowledge, but not specifically related to variability. I mean, in, I, I have used that in different contexts, but I think it's very interesting. By the okay. way, I found the, the tool really, really interesting. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. So if, if you want to see more detailed cases um, or have a question related to this, feel free to send me an email, uh, jpt at metacase.com, and we can then look any examples as you like in further detail. So I, if there are no further questions, I would like to thank you for your time and wish you a great conference.